I love it. You know, when we're in the last session of the MAA Math Fest, we're just going to have fun and have a good time. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Round of applause. My name is Talitha Washington, and I have a fantastic collaborator, Della, and uh, she keeps everything moving and grooving, and uh, she's at University of Richmond, and also Anna, who's at Tufts University, where we got together and we said, let's do a session at the MAA Math Fest. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the mathematics of data science. You're in for a tour uh, from music to statistics to curriculum uh, to social justice. This will just be an interesting tour as we go along. And I'm going to make the introduction short because y'all already know I'm long-winded. Um, so <laughs> our first presentation Oh, I like that title. I was going to read this title, but I'm, I'm going to read. Can I read that title, Dr. Abiyoni? This is Dr. Colby Abiyoni, who, who was a former senior VP at uh, Warner Media, you know, the music folks. And uh, is that right? But you'll talk about yourself. Introduce yourself. Yeah, I've known him for a while, so this just, it's informal. We're good, right? What a DJ knows, song demand prediction from oral data. Dr. Abiyomi, would you be so kind to grace us with your presence and knowledge? Thank you, Talitha, thank you. Uh, yep, you can hear me, all right. Um, informal and loose, just like, uh, just like a nice party. Um, so, I was the senior vice president for data science at Warner Music for many years. These are now me doing it separately uh, and selling it back to them. Um, this is joint work with a grad student at Georgia Tech, Go Jackets, uh, in the Center for Music and Technology, Yi Feng Yu. And I, I don't have much to say by way of introduction for this. This is just David Crosby. I love David Crosby. And one of the things that maybe will come out in conversation is the digitalization of music and the way it's delivered really provides an opportunity to dig into uh, micro genres and where people are in the listening space. And one of the things we're seeing, singer-songwriter stuff is coming back around. Um, David Cosby is a natural example of this genre. This is a beautiful tune. And this is another thing that I want you to listen to, pick up in this song, is this sort of ambient sort of quality. This is another thing that we're seeing in the uh, delivery and production of music these days is that music is becoming more utilitarian and sort of en passant of your activities. Um, but just listen to this. He's just, this is oh, such a... Oh, I said, we're all, some of us are closer to my age, but I was going to say, when I was your age, this is what I was listening to. Oh, He's just listing some cathedral along the Loire River in, in France. It's just. This is the, the sort of, um, I spent a lot of time on this slide going through stuff. Um, the point here is that audiences are not homogenous and now that we have access to audience data because each of you have a, a music delivery device in your pocket uh, that's also aware of everything else that you're doing always, we have a really good insight to how people behave, how they're enjoying music, what they like, what they don't like. And that heterogeneity is something to mine, in my opinion, for the sake of giving the people better music. So, by way of introduction, back when I was your age, again, this audience is closer to my age than, than the kids I usually talk to about this, but when I was your age, uh, I would take myself down to Tower Records uh, on a Friday, I'd ride the bus, and I would get whatever had been released that week, right? It was advertised, big cardboard stand. 
and you would go home with it. I remember the first time I did that, the very first two records I ever got from Tower Records, my dad took me and he got me one which was a sound effects record. It was the sounds of Africa, animals making noises. when I played the most. Yeah. Who knows knew that how a hippopotamus sounds? I had no idea. I would play this and go to sleep. So this record came in a red jacket with the sounds of Africa. Played it over and over and over again. I mean I a day didn't go by where I didn't play a sound effect off of the sounds of Africa. <clears throat> the second album, which was the album that I intended to buy when I, we went down to Tower Records, I want to say this was 1981, um, I was looking for Olivia Newton-John's, I think it was her fourth album, Physical, uh, which had last get Physical, Physical, on it. It was a big hit. The single was out, but as I learned later, a lot of times the single would be dropped before the album, I got the wrong album. I got the album, her 1976 album, but check this out. Good album. There's a lot of stuff in there that I hope that we can talk about as we you know, move through talking about sound and music. And that's, it was intentional that I played that song. But what was I, nine years old? It's, eh, I didn't listen to this album every day. But this, I mean, that's a fantastic tune. And what they're doing there with the synth and all that is derivative of a lot of things that were going on in music in 1976. The point is, in 1981, when I went to Tower Records and put down my 699 or whatever it was for each of these albums, each of the record labels, and by percentage-wise, the artists behind the Sound Effects album and Olivia Newton-John, her producer or whatever, would receive the same amount of money, right? Uh, the fraction of the point of sale at that instant. So the motivation then is just to get somebody excited enough to go to the store and buy a record once. The new model for how people receive compensation for music is listening volume. The fact that I listened to the sounds, the hippo sounds, over and over and over and over again <coughs> increases the amount of money, the amount of royalty share that goes to whoever was behind the sounds of the hippos. And the share that went to Living Newton John for me would be very, very small because I only listened to it once, right? And so that, that fundamental shift, because there's a smorgasbord of music available and because people are paid, record labels are compensated by the volume of listening, really changes the way in which music has been consumed and the, and, and the way in which the music companies need to respond to it. I want to play this next song for you. And this is something my daughter is into. One of the ways in which people are consuming or modifying, interacting with music on these services is to use it more of utility. It's ambient. It matches some activity that they're into while they're studying. And then they also play with it themselves. The technology is sophisticated enough now where you can take a song, modify it in some way, put it back up, and see if people like it. So check this out. I'll be like a brother. Like a friend. Just like a lover. Oh, 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 oh. You could bet that never gotta sweat that. 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 So if you, those of us in the audience who are younger, ha ha ha, no 
know right away that this is a faster version of the original, right? And kids really they like this version. So people, lots of people are doing this, taking a song, beating it up, putting it back in, interacting with the content in a dynamic way. This interactivity and the way people interact with content really is driving a lot of genre emergence. A lot of what you see in Afrobeat, derivative of house music, on the piano, this song right here, is coming from people's ability to modify current sound samples, make them quicker, slower, and then throw the content up, see if people enjoy it, take it back down. That dynamic sort of response to the goodness of what you created or not. I just think it's a little bit further. You can hear what's going on this one. Okay, so you can one, one great example, and I know Della has seen this example before, is <coughs> something we did at Warner Music for the um, uh, Stranger Things show. Um, so this here is an illustration of listening by demographic group over time, before the show, after the show. These are the streams of a song by an artist that was, again, popular for people my age, Kate Bush, uh, running up that hill before the show, after the show. And what you see here is an increase in the two younger demographics. That is like a nugget of gold for somebody in the music business. So listen to the song. The, the youngest demographic listens to music the most, and because they're the youngest, they have the most amount of time left in their life to listen to it, right? And in a model where the volume of listening is what you're going to get paid from, this is exactly what you want. And what this finding, and this is what's called a sync between putting a song on a particular show, allowed the younger audience to be exposed to something and then possibly listen to another 30, 40 years out where there's a lot. One of the great things about being able to see music as data is how can we find other examples of this that were the same sort of phenomenon. So this, here, let me just put it apart for a second. So, oops. Go back to here. So what you hear, you know, so you're hearing something similar in the two songs. You're hearing this 80s synth sound, kind of minor key, both at the same tempo. Kate Bush, English artist, English audience, Veronique Sanson, also a licensed artist, completely in French, complete catalog is in French. You could do the same thing for another show and call it, what's, how do you say in French, things, stranger, whatever. You could, so same sort of thing, right, with this song, and we can find this automatically by looking at the sound as data. <laughs> There's an interesting uh, callback or loop to the same comedy between Rodney Sands' song and Crosby, Stills, and Nash that I keep playing. She, it turns out she was Stephen Stills' wife. They have a child together. Who knew? I, yeah, I discovered all of that after finding the sample using uh, the embedding between the sound of Kate Bush's song. All right, so how can creators and curators act in this new regime? We talked a little bit about that. All right. The, the fundamental engine of all of this is being able to lick, link demographic individual characteristics to listening patterns. And I, I don't do it just by just saying listening patterns. Because listening is a very dynamic thing, right? The person who listens to house music or a house music song at 9 o'clock in the morning very different sort of listening behavior from somebody who's listening to house music, even the same song perhaps, nine o'clock at night. And that high resolution, high frequency data is what you get by having the digitalization of all content. This, this heat map along this axis is just a dimension reduction for music type. Uh, and along this axis, demographic groups. And so this popular You'll hear it. For the kids, sorry. I don't, 
I don't make the video. Siempre tengo en mente que todo acaba. Yo no me cansé de esperarte. Desde que le hablé y la mira la cara. So you know, reggaeton, this version of it. Um, you can, if this is popular, which it is, you're running a music company, what else do I have that can support this or resonate from it? And it turns out that clave or second line beat that you hear in there is ubiquitous Apareciste throughout the catalog. Cuando yo menos te estaba buscando, a los ojos me miraste, y ahí fue que me sonreíste. Tú lo notaste, yo lo noté, no lo buscaste, no lo busqué, pero pasó así, fue, fue, fue. Yo puesto pa' portarme bien, y me invitas a pecar. Oops. Pactando a las demás. That's 2019. Let's just skip 2018 go to 2004 just to demonstrate the phenomenon. Remix. 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 Oh. The intros change. Everybody likes to do a four bar intro and it's usually whatever's going on in music production at the time. It's the, the heart of the song. All right. So let's go to the next line. It turns out the way people listen to music, very, very patterned, very predictable. Uh, this is an illustration of the spectral centroids of a thousand songs across many different types of genres to see if they would fall naturally uh, in sort of multidimensional cluster analysis. And, and they do. These are all different, different sorts of songs. The time resolved has been resolved to a common release date. And what you see, the arrow's over here. So, what you see is a similar phenomenon. There's a period of attraction where audiences are becoming familiar with the song. The song peaks, hits the top of the charts, or however high it's going to hit. <clears throat> which is dependent upon a lot of other things, timing of other songs, time of year. <clears throat> and then there's the decay. And the shape and curvature of these things, this is where a music company lives, right? How much more money do I need to put into this thing so it can reach its peak? <laughs> Should I stop? Should I pull in little Yazi or whatever from the tour because this thing's dying and I'm just throwing good money after bad, right? Um, this and the area under this curve is how a music company makes its money. And it's a good thing to know that the listening is actually very predictable. How can we go from what we can ingest now and understand via the music as data to what we need to be able to do, which is predict how people are going to listen to it? And the young man in the audience basically asked me the same question that I'm going to talk about here. <laughs> we've been, I've been, we've been, futzing with this, tumbling with it for a couple of years now, to go from a relatively raw representation of the sound to one that has sound features in it that can be described either for production, like, hey, put this new bass line in it, or change the meter from 16.4 to 8 over 4, 4.4. Uh, four. <laughs> there are a, a, few, many, a few companies in the space that exist taking sounds, attributing it in different ways. One of them has an attribute of two, you know, length 200. But this is the fundamental problem, how to go from raw sound to a featureization of it that's descriptive of the demand. <coughs> Past work that we've done on this, we've been able to look at versions. So here, each of these are parts of the demand curve, like it's maxima or the amount of streaming at a certain month. Uh, and these are just illustrations of trying to predict the demand via two different sorts of models. <laughs> that categorization of the data via the demand allows us to do things like, hey, find this song. Old play song. And then, five, oops. 
too small. And then go back in the catalog and say, well, if that worked on that audience, this guy's been hanging around too. Can we get better than that? Can we get better than just, hey, this demand map looks similar uh, with to some of the metrics and get to a representation of the sound on the demand that's high resolution in the sense of it gives us the curvature and inflection points in the demand pattern that we want. <clears throat> so this is work from this summer. We started off with the Carnegie Music Map. Carnegie Music Map was put together by a Dr. Portia K. Maltzby, anybody know her? No? A uh, musicologist, apparently very famous. Um, at the end of her career, it's beautiful. You should check out the Carnegie Music Map. It's up on the web, it's interactive. And it's basically a timeline of African American music from the 1400s up till now. And that, you know, anybody who's in music knows that if you map African American music, you're going to cover and touch all the genres. And that's what we used it for. We used it for basically a covering of the music space. Like if I sample the songs from this, I should get a really good representation of all the music that's available and that people are able to listen to, you know, in a categorical way. We took that to be our covering of the sound song space, uh, went into Spotify, grabbed demand data out for it. Spotify still allows you to do this for free. I don't know why they do, but it's it's incredibly rich source of data while it exists. Um, and then worked on a model going directly from the sound and a representation of it to the demand curve using the demand representations that we learned from the Carnegie Music Map. So messed around with this a while. So I've been doing this three years and we've been picking featureizations out of, out of sound demand for a long time and it came to us that let's take a representation of this demand curve that's complete. And so one that is, is to use a spline. So we used a spline as the estimator function for the demand curve, took the representation of that spline, the vectorization, the model features from it, fed those back into, doo -doo 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 -doo. <coughs> fed those back into the neural, a neural network model as the output vector and use the sound vector of the songs themselves as the input vector. So let me go to the next one. So I say this up here. When I saw the results, which I'll show in the next couple of slides, I screamed because it, this, it's, this is so important. For, again, if you're in the music industry, to be able to go from Again, what a DJ knows or what Clive Davis knows, right? Hey, this is gonna be a hit because I can hear it and I know which audience and which demographic this goes for and to be able to do this in a codified way using data is just so important. So again, we're going from this representation, the encoding of the sound, we just use the male spectrogram, it's just the transformation of the frequency distribution and sampling uh, of the song in a certain uh, frequency. And this is what we get out of it. So the red dots, the original weekly aggregated demand of the songs, the green dot, the spline, sorry, the green line, the spline representation of it, and the blue lines are the neural network's prediction from the spline representation. So now we're going directly from the sound input vector, the spectrogram, to a representation of the demand, the spline vector. And it's, it's I, I can't hide my excitement, just the fact that it's picking up the inflection and the curvature of this, some problems with magnitude, and we're, we're, I'll show you in a second what we're, what we're doing to try to get 
the magnitude here, but it's really, really a rich representation of the demand you'll get out. These are weeks, this is half a year for each of these songs. Some fit better than others. The neural network we're using is incredibly unsophisticated, simple activation function, but we're getting inflection, we're getting convexity, we're getting curvature, we're getting trend out of that going directly from sound to this representation of the demand curve via the spline function. <clears throat> and when we augment the input vector with extra information, the region. For instance, when I go to Spotify and I say, who's listening to that Living Newton-John song? I have to say US or UK or Argentina, right? And that hints at underlying different audience patterns because people in different countries listen to things differently. <laughs> that decreases the loss, increases the precision. And then when we add not only the region to it, but extra sort of sound-derived features, that's cheating a little bit, not going from the sound, it's taking something that's featureized already. You really reduce the loss here. All right. So th th this is, cl we're closing up. I want to show you this. Dan Fogelberg just sold his catalog. I, ordinarily, it's young kids, right? Kids don't know who Dan Fogelberg is. And actually, and I picked one of his less, you know, the lead notes of the big ballads driving for a song here. If you're going to pay money for Dan Fogelberg's catalog, you need to be able to understand who might respond to Dan Fogelberg, right? You can do that scale. You have a limited amount of time to monetize Dan Fogelberg's catalog. People my age are dying out. You want to hit the age of the 25 demo. You want to know what your listening patterns are. You want to know what, what indie song might be going to attract them. So this is the part we're at now in the music industry where your older artists are going to monetize their catalog and sell them where you need this sort of work. I love that part. And so the point here is don't just do it for Dan Fogelberg. Have the whole thing running like a machine, right? Like Amazon, when you log on and it tells you that you need new toilet paper or whatever else you get from Amazon. Um, accelerates listening demand at scale. You can augment content creation because you know where the contours of listening affinity are with respect to what you're offering. And is this the last slide? It's the last slide. That's it. All right. Yes. Sure. Okay, yeah. Ask me a question. Yes. Yeah. What's the protocol for updating your model over time? Or is that not necessary at all? Sure. Um, tell me in what sense, and then I'll, I want to. So, like, uh, if your uh, listening patterns would change from a particular song over time, how do you update your own? No, that's okay. That's what I thought you were going to say. You're exactly right, right? So, for instance, so one thing is we don't have the listening patterns from 1960. Right, so we don't have the data for that. As far as like a refresh sort of thing, what we were doing was monthly, and we were doing monthly with features that didn't predict the demand as richly as this does. Um, for neural networks, you don't need a lot of data. Each one of these, I think we took 5,000 songs uh, to train this model. Um, and on the other side, the data tranches that you get are generally refreshed at maximum weekly, um, often monthly. Uh, if I were running this as a policy, I would say do it monthly. Yeah. Ask me a question. Yes, Idre. Yeah, so I'll say a couple of things. Um, I, the first thing, I mean to say it the right way. I don't think the music, no, let me not say it like that. 
<laughs> I'll say, here's the first thing I'll say. The first thing I'll say is that one of the things we also know about how people enjoy music is they like novelty and things that seem sort of orthogonal. So what you're trying to do is give somebody something that they're familiar with, has a sort of cultural sort of, you know, nostalgia in their mind, but with this new thing to it. Uh, so you, I don't think you could completely dive down on, I'm just going to play you a 440 hertz tone and you're going to be happy. Having said that though, there's a fair amount of content out there that's incredibly unsophisticated that gets a lot of listening, right? Um, music labels are very concerned and worried about that uh, because what they're good at is turning you know, an artist into a star. Uh, I do think there's something special and different about the entire sort of picture, having an artist as well. Um, the, and then the next, last thing I'll say is for people who are using so-called AI to create new content, there are, there's a joke, I, I was on the Slack at work and somebody was like, look, it's a new zero hot uh, uh, AI algorithm. I was like, that's impossible. <laughs> like, there's, 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 you have to have data. There's, that's like, there's no such thing, right? So if there are data, and if we're talking about music, probably licensed content. One of the things I think the music industry should be involved in, and there's papers where we're sophisticated enough now to be able to look at something that's generated by a diffusion model and score uh, a battery of likely training data, right? Like this is probably in that, that's probably in that. And I think that's something the music industry should be involved in. Yeah. Which one? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> sure. 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 So the input, so we have a model. This neural network model, very simple neural network model, simple activation function that takes the sound via a spectrogram, just sound content, to sample it at a particular frequency, a particular time, um, stick it in as an input vector, try to predict the spline vector representation of demand. So we've always been able to draw these curves, not the blue one but the green one and the dots, right? This is a demand curve. You see how much money is coming in the door, how many people are listening to it over time. <clears throat> how do I predict that? Um, no one knows, right? I, it, I can, it, it's, it's the holiday season, this is so-and-so artist, there's some seasonality. <laughs> dynamics, I showed you a picture of a model that had, just had dynamics on it, birth, death, where you're looking for change points. <clears throat> but can you go from the sound? Can I listen to something, the computer listen to something, the model listen to something, and say, hey, this is likely what you're going to get out of this as far as demand. And that's what this is, yep. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So different scoring. Who, what's your music listening of choice? Your your DSP, your your streaming provider of choice. Spotify. So I'll tell you, Spotify. Spotify is in a situation where they're trying to maximize their revenue, and out of all of the, I would say, the major streaming providers, they're probably the most concerned about it. Amazon has got an entire business that music can be a loss leader. Apple has got an entire business, music can be a loss leader. Spotify is paying, who knows what they're paying, the AWS to run this whole thing. And then <clears throat> 56, 57 percent to the music industry. So Spotify is very interested <coughs> at keeping you on and pushing you towards unlicensed content or content, excuse me, content of, of, of low royalty rate. Um, I would imagine, I don't know your listening patterns, you may notice Spotify pushing you towards streaming, 
um, content like a podcast or one of the things they do is they'll send you a song that's here's, this, this is a bad example I don't want to get anybody to scream at me so Taylor Swift had a bad record deal right and so her original you know first couple albums the masters for that sound like Taylor Swift people listen to them Taylor Swift redid her masters right and so if you listen to the new one or old one, I haven't listened to any of it. But if you listen to the new one or old one, it's, there's a different um, millage rate, right? And so Spotify would choose. If all things else are, are the same, I'm going to push you towards this one, which is going to cost us less. Okay, welcome to the impromptu panel on data science. Uh, what I thought we would do, we have four data scientists here who are all doing very different kinds of works at very different kinds of places. So I, so I thought we'd just start by having everyone introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how you got there. Why don't we start on your end, Kobe, and we'll come this way. Hey, Kobe, you guys just heard me talk. I work in music and data science. Uh, I, I took a left turn. <laughs> That's the I, I, I started off, I, I got a PhD in probability statistics, I did a couple postdocs, I was a professor um, in industrial engineering and environmental science. Uh, then I left to go to um, the corporate world, say mid 2010s, and that time, at that time ad tech was becoming a big thing where people were learning that we could follow people on their phones and divine information about them, so I worked for a credit rating company and worked a lot in ad tech. And that's what set me up to end up staying in ad tech until I switched over to music, which is like the other side of it. Um, instead of trying to show people commercials, I'm trying to get people to listen to music. But it, which is nice, though, because um, my part-time job when I was in grad school, I was a DJ. And so I used to, yeah. that's my story. So go ahead. After you left Warner Music, you start, what, what do people do when they have coding chops after they have their job? They launch a startup. Oh, I thought we were going to go, okay. Um, uh, which, what do you want me to say? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. You left Warner Music Group and started your startup. Oh, oh, yeah. So I worked for Warner Music Group for several years. And uh, now I've started a company that just does what I've been talking about, which is take data and predict who might listen to what uh, so that companies can optimize and get the most money out of their content. And hopefully this turns into not just a company that does that, but eventually my own music label. So then you'll, next time you see me, I'll be wearing like a leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a cigar and Sunglasses. stuff like that. Sunglasses, okay. big chain, the whole thing. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Talitha. Hi, my name is Talitha Washington. I am, anything specific or just ramble on about Where myself? Where you are and how you got there. Okay, where I am. I am uh, the director of the Atlanta University Center Data Science Initiative that works across uh, four historically black colleges and universities in Atlanta, including Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Spelman College, all things data science, both on the research end and the curriculum end. And we're now launching out where we're not only going to work across four, but just 107 um, HBCUs. So, you know, it, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? It's kind of wild. You know, it's, it's a lot, but you know, it's, it's good work. But even, um, so I started this in October 2020, uh, and even, uh, we're all data geeks, so we've actually engaged about 42 HBCUs in our programming, even without having that as a, uh, as a, a focus. Um, so it's just kind of taking what we're doing and, and focusing and, and doing more of it. We have uh, seminars on our YouTube channel. Dr. And, and, and other things. We also have uh, symposiums, one in September, one in February. We do a myriad of workshops. Um, Spelman College is going to do a generative AI uh, program this fall for their faculty, so we're supporting that effort. And we just, you know, I get to hang out for, with the medicine folks to the criminal justice people to the, you know, chemistry folks. You know, I, I get to hang out with everybody, which is probably the best part. Is there anything? And I'm a mathematician, so by training, I do um, dynamical systems, uh, systems of ordinary partial difference equations, math mathematical modeling. So I think about things in a systems perspective, 
uh, both in the mathematics that I do and also in the work that I do. So I see HBCUs really as a, as a network of entities that are joined together through data. Just like that. Okay. Can, you can you repeat the instructions? <laughs> oh, sorry. Introduce sorry. yourself, where you are in the world, and how you got to be where you are. You have such an interesting story. I'll just give you a spoiler alert. She shifted fields into data science just now. Yes, yes, okay, so you, are all, you all are meeting me in sort of the midst of a research transition. I'm, I'm a commutative uh, algebraist by training, um, and presently I am a Berlecamp postdoc at MSRI slash SL Math, um, and my, my host institution when I'm not there is, is Duke University, um, where I will be a postdoc studying the mathematics of redistricting, and so this is sort of what uh, has been central to my data science story. Uh, during the pandemic, I sort of thought long and hard about what it was that would keep me in academia, what kind of work I wanted to do that I would find purposeful, and I'm really interested in, in what I call quantitative justice, so applying mathematics and statistics and computer science to um, problems that are rooted in, in some sort of social inequity. And so right now I think a lot about the mathematics of redistricting, but I've also thought about mathematics uh, of policing. And, and in general, there's a lot of data there. Um, and so uh, a big part of my daily activities are learning and then applying the things that I learned to right now think about uh, the redistricting problem, uh, which can be modeled as a graph partition problem for if that means something to folks. So I'm happy to talk about that, uh, but that is me. I'm Ranthony Edmonds. And I think, I think this is like a good summary of the, what was asked, right? That was fine. That was, that was fine. Okay, we're good. There we go. And Ranthony just joined the panel, so we thank her for <laughs> her presence. Hi, my, I'm Vinod Manander. Uh, I am from Clark Atlanta University. I'm a science professor there. So uh, my journey to the direction is start from uh, as a government job. I was a statistician at the government of Nepal, and I work with the official statistics and the survey data and we used to do the official analysis, statistics analysis. And then I thought that, okay, I have to do some detailed uh, story. Then I come to United States and I did a PhD. And since then I was um, from, from government of Nepal up to here, I'm working all the time with the data and the statistics. And uh, data is a power actually. Data is a power because it is information. So, uh, as a, it is like, like the fingers, right? If, if it is a one finger, it doesn't have a lot of strain. If it is a five finger, it has a strain, right? Same thing. So, everybody needs the information. Government will be strong if he has the information, right? Same thing. Now, data is the information. If you combine the, a lot of data, right, it has a lot of strain. And Data science is that one that can you extract the important info. Information could be false if you do the wrong way. Right? Information could be wrong. Information can lead you to the wrong place. That's what you need a skill. Right? Human error, there is error in a human as well as in machine. Human can make an error today and correct tomorrow. If you, if you machine do the error, it will repeat, right? Unless and until you correct it. So in that way, machine can make a big error. Human can make an error, but it can correct it. The machine can make a big error, right? And the data science is just like the, it's kind of the, feel that everybody required. Not like uh, only the statistician or the computer science or... Because every field generated data. Every field. This hotel generated data and he want to analyze his data so that he can improve. Now somebody has to work on that one, right? If you go to the hospital, they generate the data a lot. And who will be analyzing that data to get the information? Before, now maybe 20 years before, nobody talked about a data center, right? 
because uh, whoever do the data science is maybe the government body because they need the official statistics or they need to the analyze the survey data or the census data, right? Or the big business person maybe analyze. It means that they do the analysis, but now because of the electri electronic data, you, we everybody collects data and a lot of informations and and we want to if we want to have the good information that can lead us to the uh, predict or the lead us to the new invention or the new place or the whatever it may be, right? That's what the data science is. So I feel that the data science will be kind of a one basic course for every field in coming near future. So that they can analyze their data by themselves, at least do some kind of a visualization at least do kind some kind of a cleaning. That's what I think that the data science will be growing a lot in near future. And that's what we can see many, many schools, they are offering the data science classes, integrating data science. And it's not only for the government body, they are doing the data science or the for, uh, for the statistician doing the, the data analysis or the computer science doing the some kind of machine learning stuff or the artificial intelligence. It will grow. That's what I think. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question. Since we have so many students here, how about a suggestion or tip for how to get in the field or something that would make you successful in the field? Like linear algebra is a really important class. I just made that up. <laughs> Kobe, you want to start with oh, you sure, again? Yeah. Linear algebra is a very important class. <laughs> There's this one class that I'm thinking of, well, it's actually two of them, and I, I have to tell the whole story. I took both of these classes and dropped them halfway through, and every time I'm trying to do something, I'm like, man, I wish I would have finished those classes. Um, <laughs> numerical algorithms, um, I took two versions of it, one in undergrad, another one for PDEs and grad. <coughs> it's so important. At some point, you know, you're finished scratching stuff on a piece of paper and you need to get into a computer and have it work. And that generally is an optimization problem, which involves a linearization of something which was nonlinear. And there's the people who actually know how to do this have, you know, a, a volume of tricks to apply at those. Uh, and I'll say from being on the other side and hiring a bunch of people in so called data science, that's it's a rare skill and, and very valued people who actually know numerical algorithms. Numerical algorithms are fun, right? Numerical methods, numerical analysis, and implementing. All right, so for, um, so, you know, spoiler alert, I will be speaking today at 530, 530, right, though? in this room, um, where I'm going to actually talk about different curriculum at the undergraduate level, how people are thinking about it. Uh, so that will happen at 530, if, if, you know, yeah, hang on. Uh, but so there are, I think, okay, so this is, this is what I think, yeah, I'm, I'm open for uh, the discourse. Just like in math, you have pure and applied math, just like in computer science, you have more of the theoretical comp side and more of the applied comp side. I'm seeing that uh, happening, at least from my perspective, in data science, where you have an, an applied data science of sorts being implemented by those maybe in the social sciences, uh, and also like biology, can, you know, and then you have people who are developing the algorithms to meet, or the, or the processes or methodologies or techniques or approaches, whatever you want to call that, to, to actually meet the, the demands or, or of data that's available to us so you can make sense of it. So I, I'm seeing this, you know, how, how do we rectify this uh, more, I don't, some people call it foundational data science, but I don't like that name. So I don't know if it's theoretical data science, or I don't know what to call it. So if anybody has a name for it, I think y'all know what I'm talking about though, right? What do y'all call it? Anybody have a name for it? No, okay, so I'll just say- Statistics. Statistics? <laughs> That's just more terrible than foundational data science. I don't know, right? Would you, theoretical data science, or, or I don't know. And then there's the applied side. So I think on, it, it depends on kind of what you want to do with it. And then 
so this kind of came more clear to me when, um, so I have a, I have a 23 member faculty advisory board and we invited Columbia to talk about their master's program. And their, their master's program is very theoretical in data science. And the question is, you know, for some of these data science jobs that are out there, it's not needed to know all of the theoretical, technical, uh, we'll say uh, math stuff, programming stuff, I don't know, what do you, whatever you want to call it. However, in certain jobs it is needed, right? And so, and certain jobs actually want you to have more of applied, understanding context, being, you know, malleable, flexible, and meet the, the demands of the problems that you're working on. So how, how do we think through that? So as far as, uh, I think what can prepare somebody for data science at the fundamental level, you gotta be able to program in multiple languages having the language of algorithms, I guess some people call it pseudocode, whatever, uh, being able to go from R to Python, uh, being able to work in, in SQL, work in databases, I think that's foundational um, knowledge for, for everyone. Uh, and then also being able to uh, employ, it's in my slides, employ the scientific me method when approaching uh, data-oriented problems. I, th I think most of us do this naturally. When y'all when come to my talk, you'll, you'll tell me if you don't. But most of us do this naturally. We see a problem, we have an idea about what we think is going to happen, and then we kind of carry it out, you know, that whole scientific method. Uh, being able to think through these open-ended questions in data science that where Bob is not there. Bob is back a book, right? Yeah, no. you get that, Bob? Mm -hmm. but Bob? Bob is not there for you, right? Bob's not in the room. There is no back of book, textbook answer for a lot of these uh, problems. And so the idea of having an open mind for exploratory um, analysis, thinking, asking questions, um, and then arriving maybe at something, but then say, well, what am I missing? What am I, and, and then just keep uh, moving it forward. Um, so I think there's a level of inquisition um, that's also helpful. Well, that's helpful in everything. Uh, but like I said, th the computer programming, obviously a, um, I would say foundational um, statistical visualization is, is typically the first thing you wanna do. Uh, when, when you're making sense, it depends on the data, but it's, it's nice to visualize stuff um, or hypothesize the structure of the data sets that you have. So there's some statistical approaches, there's uh, mathematical approaches when we think about quantifying, when we think about units, when we think about uh, just relating things, that logical deductive reasoning is helpful as well. Um, so I'm, ju I'm just going to the foundational, but and those are the technical aspects there's also needs to be an understanding of the domain in which the data set lives. Most data, I think, most interesting data science problems have a context, like music. So understanding where that piece of data lies in a bigger story. Uh, so some of our comp sci, love our comp sci students, they'll come and they just want to program. Like, wait a minute, pause. We, there's a story here, there's a context and, um, and sometimes that context does drive um, how we approach and interact with the data. So being able to have that balance between let's do this data science work and also let's make sure we understand what it is, how it is, and being able to tell that story, you know, can, I think is fun. But I, I, I didn't say linear algebra. I think linear algebra is on the, if, I don't know what to call it, the theoretical data science side. I think that's where that lies. But like on the applied data science side, I'm not convinced linear algebra is needed. You know, so it's kind of... controversial. Not in applied data science. Throw the gauntlet down. Not, huh? What do you need call? linear algebra. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> 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 applied, you, oh, okay. We're going to tell. But it's there lurking underneath of everything. But you're saying it doesn't, like you don't need to know it. Is, it, is that what you mean, like? Yeah, so, so, so there's a lot of data uh, analysis that happens, um, but so let's say I'll just use the example of Bernard's, uh, Dr. Mann and Harris, a colleagues in social work. And they have data repositories in the field of social work. Uh, they look at foster care and what, what's happening with that data. And just to, I think for the initial mining and interpretation of the data set, linear algebra is not needed for that. No, no. So I think that 
the technical skills that are needed are driven, I think, by the inquiry and also the data set in which one is trying to harness information from. Data science is one of those fields that one, what, what's the hammer nail analogy? Like, once, is it like, I once every hammer, everything looks like a nail? You say, everything looks like a nail. Oh, if you have a hammer, you pound nails, right? Yeah, that doesn't work in data science. So, and so there's a little bit of, let me take a step back, what's needed, you know? And, and, and I think that's a part of the ambiguity that kind of sets people off. Like mathematicians, we like order. It must be this, it must be that, and everything must be the same. Yeah, that's not happening in data science, which is part of what, what I like about it. I think it's probably because I'm myself and random and weird, I don't know. But that, that's, that's just my view. You know, we could, I'm open for discourse. <laughs> so I think I want to like uh, speak more to what I have and am experiencing as someone who's like newer to this. Um, my perception is that like if you're a student, maybe you are enrolled in math courses, but like their data lights. So you recognize that there's this field that's happening out there and you want to be exposed to it, but maybe it's not your predominant major. Or maybe you're like myself and your training didn't classically include data science proper. Um, and so you're coming at this as like an enthusiast or someone with interest, whether it be for your own projects or for research or for students. And I, I found that sort of very overwhelming at first. Like, what do you even, where do you even start? because data science is a huge umbrella term and so it's like where specifically in this universe do I want to land like what skills am I trying to get so, so there's these foundational questions of just where am I trying to go that I think need to be sorted out um, and and I guess my one blanket advice just like pick a direction and then start from there and then if it's maybe not the right one you can scale back but just the decision paralysis of trying to figure out what to learn first I think is something that is a big hindrance, um, at least anecdotally from my friend group. Um, one way that I've seen people address this is to do some sort of formal program. Um, there are a lot of like boot camps, um, online modules, some better than others, et cetera, that have allowed people to sort of retool. Uh, Ohio State, uh, where I did a postdoc um, and will be a, a faculty member in the future, has a program called the Erdos Institute. And this was designed um, for mathematicians originally who were interested in industry. And so like the videos do talk about like the algebra that's happening and they like describe because like mathematicians would maybe want to know whereas other people would be like no let me copy and paste the code and move on with my life but there's like layers and so it's um free as an fyi um and it's erdos as in like uh, paul erdos from the erdos number mm -hmm. but i don't know what the dot dot is that an umlaut no what is that called well, for erdos it's like a umlaut but it's twice as long as an ordinary okay okay there it is. Yes, so, so this is one, one example is that to do a formal program that will teach you a particular set of skills and from there kind of be like, okay, reassess. Um, one thing in terms of just getting better at something, I would suggest finding a data set or a repository, some sort of place that has information that you can kind of get obsessive about. Um, because at the end of the day, when you're learning a new skill, I think it's kind of frustrating to not know things. I like to know things. So when you don't know things, it's not always the most fun. And so having like data that I can get really obsessed about, really interested in, can kind of help me overcome the discomfort of not really knowing what I'm doing initially. Um, and that's gonna be different for everyone. Like what I might get obsessed about just might not do it for you, you know, and vice versa. So, so that's another thing. Um, and, and I guess the third thing, so the first is like find a formal program. The second would be find data that you can be kind of obsessed about to practice. Um, and the third would be to try to find a community um, of support. Um, and so a, a boot camp is one thing because you can kind of do this on your own. But I'm thinking about sort of instructors who are wanting to do something new in their classrooms or like people who are really honestly trying to join new research communities, it's just very difficult to do by yourself. There are knowledgeists that are sort of colloquial in different subsets of fields that you just won't be able to tap into without being able to have those conversations with people who are already in the room. And so whatever sort of you need to do to get there, I'm not sure, but trying to do it alone seems to be a way to ensure it will happen slowly, at least in my experience um, of trying to integrate into 
like a new sort of like workspace. These are my anecdotal experiences. Um, once again, the boot camp, I have academic colleagues who I went to grad school with who've transitioned out of academia through these boot camps. Um, and then myself, how I was able to sort of get into redistricting and, and learn more about data science was to find data sets that I could kind of get obsessed about and, and play around and, and learn more about pandas and, and Python and, and, and all of these things. Um, and then I, I had to sort of eventually find ways via conferences, workshops, et cetera, to get like new peers, uh, just so I could be exposed to knowledges that just don't really exist via Google searches. Uh, so uh, for, uh, when we talk about the data, right? Uh, if, if you give me the data and the, the data to the another persons, they will, they will approach the data in a different way, right? So I may apply the one tool and the next person may apply the another tool. But the requirement is that uh, they need just like a further data science. You learn some basic programming skill a little bit or some basic statistics. I don't say that um, big statistics are the big programming. But you, we want to use a tool and that tool is a can you extract the information? For example, you use a regression, right? We use a regression a lot. That's a very popular, right? Can you use that? Can we use that tool? But we do not need to know that all the details, how it will, yes, it was built. So we, the, the data science user must know that how to use that tool, and that will help. So some basic. Uh, uh, skill of the programming and how to use the tool and some basic skill of the uh, <coughs> statistics and you have to build according to the requirement it is it, right in your field because everybody every field doesn't use the same tool because their approach may be different or their requirement may be different and they may be the different tool and they need to know how to use according to their requirement tool right Okay, I have another question, but it just occurred to me. Does anyone want to ask a question of the panel or a specific person? Okay, I'm going to move on to my third question. Since we have <coughs> such a wide array, we have Kobe starting launching his startup, uh, Talitha an administrative position, Ranthony a postdoc, Binod a faculty member, why don't you all say, as best you can, a day in the life? A day in the life at the office. Uh, I, well, I started the night before when I go to sleep at 8 o'clock. And uh, <laughs> I do. So I get up at like 5. Um, if I'm not taking my child to school, I go sit down and do some work, the, I have the first meeting around nine o'clock. Uh, I try to write between five and nine. Uh, I have a paper that I owe Della <laughs> and Talitha. Um, meetings midday, uh, this is unique to the music industry. Nobody likes, <coughs> excuse me, to take meetings before 10 o'clock because they're all out drunk the, the night before. Um, so that gives me some free time in the morning. Um, but they're generally work, you know, through the afternoon, um, ending around five, five thirty. Uh, something I feel like this description is not useful for uh, data science, math. I'm just telling you, like my day in a boring way. Then I have almonds. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, I learn new things in the morning. So um, you know. When you're writing a paper, you're coming across other books. If there's a paper that I need, I'll put in for it and hope it comes back. Um, so like the new stuff and learning like new math or new methodology to help me along and be in the morning. Um, as part of what I'm doing is running a business which has little to do with logic and, <laughs> and math. Um, that's just the stuff that I try to put towards the middle of the day. It's hard to go back and forth, right? Um, when I was a professor, it was hard to go back and forth between teaching and then working on your own stuff. And so uh, this is similar in that regard. 
Yeah, I'm, I'll be just this. <laughs> right, I know, I know. No, I know. I, yeah, you know. Right. I do go to sleep at 8. Yeah, I do like to go to sleep at 8, which, you know, it means I, when I come to the meetings, I'm like, ah, oh, people. And then I go to sleep late, and I'm like, oh, next day. But anyway, okay, so I usually go to sleep about, about 8 o'clock, just kind of lay it down. And then I usually wake up about 4, and my routine is I'll put on the nightly news from the night before, you know, playing on YouTube, and that's when I like, so it's like about 20 minutes, right, show, because there's no commercials, maybe for 18 minutes. And so I dedicate that time to doing the dishes, doing laundry, sweeping the floor, and I'm like, so I just do like a morning clean the first like 18 minutes while watching the news, you know, make, making my bed every day sort of thing. And then I give my, uh, of course I'll have a cup of coffee during that, and then I'll get a second one <laughs> when I'm done. Sit at the computer, that's when I, that's what actually is interesting. That's when I do my thinking. Um, that's when I do my writing. I can't, like when I write and when I'm thinking through either programs or processes, I, I like uninterrupted thought. And, uh, you know, when you have staff and all that, you know, people call you, you know. I answer the four presidents, four provosts, director of the library and executive director, and then I have staff. So everybody calls me, right? Everybody wants something. Um, so in the morning, that's when I can have my time. And I think that started when I had kids because that's when they would sleep and that would be before my day job started. I could have that time as my own. So I just, you just shift your schedule for whatever life um, happenings. And then I'll usually, by about six, so then I'll work for an hour and a half, a couple hours depending. Then about six-ish, I'll go to the gym. I'm a gym rat. Yeah, st I'll either do step aerobics, kickboxing. Uh, I like to do weights, hit, that's high intensity interval training. I'm a certified dance to fit instructor. I'm certified, never really taught, but you know. I can do the Tamiya line dance really well. <clears throat> if you don't know, okay, anyway. The Tamiya line dance? The Tamiya line dance. Okay. We're gonna do that at the joint math meetings. Okay. I'm just gonna name it here. I don't know exactly. I'm gonna have to talk to Dr. Uh, Lewis, Tarina Lewis about that. But um, yeah, but yeah, so I do that in the morning to kind of get my uh, brain uh, going for the day blood flowing, all the rest of that. And then my meetings usually start about 9, 9.30. And on a bad day, I could have like 15 meetings in a day. It's just bam, bam, bam. I'm like, oh my God. But anyway, I'm talking to really cool people, right? So before I came here, I was in DC. I went to NSF Includes meeting. And so this guy was like, hey, I want to talk to you. Like, I don't know who this guy is. I'm fine. I was like, oh, you're doing AI at Google and you have like social science impacts and you're trying to do product development? So I'm walking from my hotel to the, you, to the conference site and, and talking to this guy at Amazon, what he's doing, and it's just a fun conversation. So a lot of those meetings and conversations is with people who are doing some really cool stuff. He'll be in our seminar September 8th, he's confirmed. So, <laughs> you know, the Friday at 12 noon, it will be recorded and, and broadcast live on, on Facebook, so yeah. Yeah, so he's going to be on there. But um, so I get to interact with, uh, you know, just different people from all over. Um, and so I'll have meetings. I'll try to do planning. I'm a director. So that's the admin side of things. So that means I direct people what to do. So about by 3 o'clock, if you ask me, do I want tea or do I want water, I'll have decision fatigue. I'll be like, I don't know. I, just tell me what to do. Um, so yeah, usually about three o'clock, I'm just toast. Uh, and, you know, um, but it's okay. So I'll usually, that's when I'll kind of, I'm either finishing up meetings, hopefully the meetings end before seven, or just kind of, you know, going through emails. Large chunk of my job is emails. And I will say this, Grammarly is the MVP. Y'all know Grammarly? Mm-hmm. Grammarly, I love Gram you know, Gram Grammarly. Grammarly's amazing. Because, uh, you know, a lot of my work is emails, and people will judge based on emails. Y'all know I'm talking about punctuation, spellings, and Grammarly has saved me. Oh, God, I love Grammarly. Oh. Okay, anyway, I don't work for them. I just, and they probably now have all my data because, you know, they probably collect it in a cloud and put it somewhere, whatever. Uh, yeah, and so then, you know, by like six, seven, then I'm kind of um, hopefully done ish for the day because usually my brain is tanked by then. Uh, and then I'll, I'm a, 
I'm an empty nester, so I eat like a, my kid, my college kid says I eat like a college student, and she says that in a derogatory way, so I don't really know what that means. So she goes off to college set telling me to eat something green when she's gone, so I, yeah. So then I usually get some food from some venue, I don't know where, usually not from me cooking because I'm too tired, and I'm a telenovela junkie, uh, <laughs> which are Mexican soap operas, so I'm watching La Reina del Sur, and it's on Netflix, so I... I kind of veg out on, on that for maybe just like an episode and then I'll um, pass out and kind of go back at it. So that's kind of, is that the day that you, but the meetings, like I said, I could talk anywhere from, you know, somebody who's doing AI at Google um, to uh, provost saying, hey, can you do this? You know, AI, everybody loves AI now, right? Can you do this generative AI at Spelman so we can do this whole faculty? Sure. Um, I remember in the fall semester, we had the director of the U.S. Census come down, one of the colleagues, uh, Dr. Celeste Lee, she said, hey, you know, I'm bringing Robert Santos down. I said, oh yeah, I was on a panel with him, let's do that. You know, he runs the whole U.S. Census, so we got to organize a, a lunch and learn and kind of figure out what they're doing, how people think about the U.S. Census and how to fill in the gaps of data. And so I get to explore these different topics with people you know, across the institutions and also in academia, you know, industry and government. So it's, yeah, it, it, it keeps it fun. Hello, okay, so I'm, I wanna, what can I add that is different? So I, I aim to be in bed around 10, but it doesn't always happen. Um, and, and I do aim to be at the gym. Um, when I'm meeting with my trainer, I am there at like six, but if not, I just, get there when I get there. Um, so as a postdoc, I think one big thing for me is like when I was in grad school, I'm working on my thesis and my dissertation. This is sort of like a, a, a project with a central theme and it was sort of the main one, the only one I was working on, honestly. And then as a postdoc, it's like, oh, it's maybe not sustainable to pick one problem and work on it for four years and then try to publish later because at that point, I probably won't like be employed or you know it's it's not like a sustainable model and so i had to figure out how to balance like multiple research projects um some of them very similar some of them may be a bit distinct especially because i'm changing fields so i have like a project in my prior field for my doctoral work but then i have new collaborations and so um parts of my day are sort of built around like sustaining momentum for those projects so there's doing the thinking just allowing myself space to think about um, the math for a particular project. There's having usually virtual meetings about a research project. Um, and this is sort of things that are actively happening. Once you get a paper, there's like the new journey of trying to get it published and the admin work related to that or the, the, the stuff that comes from talking about the work, right, and just emails about that. Um, emails about writing things up. So I guess uh, I also have meetings, but most of them are related to the research projects that I'm involved with, um, which also include my outreach and hidden figures work, which I haven't really talked about, but that I do. Um, I do a lot of work related to black math history. Um, and, and so yeah, so I go to the gym be, and I do things in the morning for me, like I like to read, um, and the ins and outs of like what kind of, t I, it, the point is just like I, I think everyone at least so far has talked about having time just for themselves, which I think is like a really good thing uh, to do just as a person regardless of if you're a data scientist or not. Um, and, and I'm in the gym and I, I try to like lift weights and so all I want to do is like lift heavy and be happy is sort of like my motto in general for this year. Um, so I spend a lot of time trying to get my form right. <laughs> so, so I spend a lot of time trying to get my form right for squats and like deadlifts and things like that. Um, but yeah, so most of my day is spent around thinking about my research projects and the stuff that comes from that, which is either meeting about a particular ongoing project, meeting about a paper that has resulted from a project, meeting about administrative work uh, related to outreach that came from research that happened years ago. Um, and, and because I'm a postdoc, things are relatively freer. So I'm not teaching. Um, and I, I, I have an NSF postdoc, which allows me a lot of flexibility to travel. And so, um, 
the work that I do when I'm traveling, I find really fun. I got to go visit Boston a couple weeks ago, um, and I got to visit Munduchin in her lab. And like I got there, and then like immediately got whisked into a research meeting um, about topological data analysis and election data in Chicago, and then whisked to a lunch, and there was a civil rights attorney who had been involved in the Supreme Court case. Um, in uh, the initial uh, uh, case that was in Alabama, and that was really fascinating to talk to him. And so it's like when I'm doing work in like quantitative justice, now my research meetings aren't just with like other mathematicians, they're very interdisciplinary, you get to meet with social scientists. I find it lots of fun. Um, but some people would hear my day and say that it sounds completely exhausting and like I don't want to do all that. And it's like, well, that's fine, you know. Um, but as a postdoc, it, it, it's much different than when I'll be a faculty member and then there'll be like committee meetings and like, you know, allegiance to a department in which you have to contribute as opposed to what I'm doing now, which is like just kind of, I tell me what to do and I, I sort of do my own thing um, research wise, which I find very freeing because I have a lot of autonomy and um, it's fun. But I know it won't last forever, so I'm enjoying it while I can. What I do is uh, most of the time I will be in school because uh, I'll be thinking about my uh, finishing my pending paper and it takes time because uh, there may be the quarter and it takes time, sir. Mm. And what I think is that uh, I have to work, uh, either I have to work uh, in my apartment or work in the office and I f office space is a little bit uh, better for me <laughs> for working. So I'll be most of the time in my school. <laughs> and when I go for the dining and they ask, uh, uh, tomorrow is uh, Saturday. Will it open? And they will ask, tomorrow? So are you coming Saturday? So I'll be most of the time in the school. When I go, uh, try to come back for the house, there may be the only one car in the garage, <laughs> my car. So I'm just thinking about uh, finishing my pending paper and uh, what happened most of the time for me is that uh, if I wrote a code, it will be a long, long code, right? And I will forget why I wrote <laughs> so, it. When I revise it, it will kind of uh, take a lot of time to understand what I did. Uh, so it take a long time. So it, reading code is very hard actually, not reading code of order, but uh, reading code if you have written by yourself, that is also hard because you <laughs> forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so thank you. Last fast question. And then, then we're gonna transition. The highlight of your day and the challenging part, the most challenging part of your day. One sentence each. Are the most joyful part of your day and the most challenging part? I was actually going to ask since we had a small audience, but I guess I won't do it. No, I just wanted to know more about the people who are here. Um, and you know, everybody's where you're from, what you're studying. Why you stayed? You young man in the yellow, that's what I do when, I, when I'm teaching class. <laughs> it's a good way to get called out and need to go to the bathroom or something like that. <laughs> Ho there. <laughs> well, anyway. I like I'm not engaging with this. He's smart. And, and, and when I'm teaching undergraduates, you know, he would get a grade, right? So he wouldn't keep doing that. But. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> Your University of Toronto? I have a really good friend. What say? Oh, York, okay. Nice. Oh, you do? Oh, wow, that's great. Okay. Okay, cool. What's the school? The problem is I know like nothing. So well, what's the college? Illinois College and it's a small liberal arts college, thirty miles west of Springfield, Illinois. Uh -huh. So um, so I figured I would come here and see how much I didn't know. Hi, I'm That's a problem. Hi, my name is Jason. I'm a chair and professor of mathematics at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And I came and gave the invited professor on math and music on Tuesday. Mm. And uh, I've been applying mathematics to musical histories, in particular history surrounding the music of the Beatles. And recently I used data science uh, to find out whether John or Paul wrote in my life. What do you think? And the young man in the back? Just who you are, um, your interest in data science, this session? Okay, cool. Nice. Donald, do you think if maybe Talitha could talk a little bit about it seems like several people were starting data Curriculum. science program, yeah. So at 5.30, here's your quick infomercial. This is for me too, right? I'm actually going to be talking about um, data science major <coughs> programs, plural, um, for a different flavoring, going from a liberal arts perspective, from a, um, I guess coming out from a computer science perspective, coming from a math 
perspective and then coming from an engineering perspective. Everything's interdisciplinary. So I, I'm actually going to compare and contrast um, three different uh, majors and also talk about um, some of the papers that are guiding how we're thinking about uh, data science undergraduate curriculum. So I'm going to focus on that just because, you know, people told me to do that. So I'm just going to share and hopefully you all will give feedback too. Yeah. That's 5, 5.30. So I'm going to talk about uh, non-family region internal migration and FIM, non-family region internal migration and their socio-economic characteristics during 2010 and 11. So this is a joint work uh, with my two graduate students, Christine Young and Walter James. Uh, so talking about a background, what is a migration, and then my resource questions and uh, data source, and starting with the uh, ever-migrated population, and then taking the subset as a uh, non-family region internal migrations, and I will be talking, and my work is in this part, non-family region internal migration, and then apply the it is a binary data, either you are migrated or you are not migrated, right? So it's a binary data. So we, we fit a logistic model and conclusion. So we start with the migration definition. So migration means that it's a movement of people from one country or the, from one location to the other, right? That is a mi migration. And why the people migrated? So the reason for the migration is that uh, there is a pull and push factor, right? Pull and push factor. It means that uh, there is a gap between the origin and the destination of the mig migration, right? There is a gap, and the pull factor could be pull fa push factor could be unemployment, low wage, poor urban lifestyle, and a low career expectation. And the full factor could be better economic perspective, higher salaries, better life standard, career building, and those kind of uh, are the, if there is a gap between two areas, then that make a people migration. And if the gap is small, then the migration will be less. <coughs> now, I'm talking about internal migration. So the internal migration, it is a migration within some, within country or within the area. Now similarly, the reason of the internal migration will be, could be the family reason, could be the family reason, it get married and uh, move to the another place, or because of the higher education, you want to get a higher education and uh, move, or you want to get a suitable job and you move to the another place or maybe the higher salary you want, you have offered a higher salary in the next place and you went there or that you want to do the business and you moved or you want to have the easier lifestyle in somewhere else and you want to go there right and the internal migration may could happen in broadly in either the family reason or the non-family reason internal migration and i am focusing on non-family reason internal migration Now, research question. So, this talk is about this research is about a non family reason internal migration. Question is Are there differences in socio economic, economic, economic and demographic characteristics between the non family reason internal migration population and other population? Now, if you have the population of the non family reason internal migration and the other population, now you have the two group, right? Do they have the different characteristics or they are generally the same? That is a question. And does the non-family region internal migration bring only the change in the local population or it brings change in the socio-economic and demographic characteristics? Now people move, right? Does this make the plus or minus in the population or it also bring the change in econo socio-economic characteristics of that place? And that is a question. Now, source of data. The source of data is a Nepal Living Standards Survey. 
and whichever I am using this data here 2010 and 11 it is the latest data available for the living standard that's what I am using that one the latest data the survey is conducted by the government <coughs> central bureau of statistics it is conducted by the central bureau of statistics and the survey it is a design survey so it follows the living standard measurement survey methodology developed by the world bank and it collects the data about a living standard and the one question one section is about section four is about a migration so it has a one section about a migration and the survey has 5988 household enumerated 6000 around 6000 and this is a survey and the targeted household is 5.4 million so survey is a very small proportion right around 6000 and the targeted is 5.4 million and the individual in the data is 28474 individual in that data set and the targeted is 26.4 million because it is a survey data you have to target right population now we are talking about the population that is migrated so migration question is asked only for the people who who are five years and older so five years and older in the data set has 25,817 person in records and the targeted is 23.9 million okay. now how that migration is defined in that survey migrant a person who has changed usual place of residence and the boundary of usual place of residence is like a municipality or the village development committee that is a boundary if that cross then it's a migrant and if there are more than multiple migrants the last migrant is considered migration is considered now that living standard survey has 36.9 percent ever migrated population the survey had 36.9 and non-family reason internal migration is 7.04 percent only so it's a very small proportion here 7.04 percent now start from the ever migrated population it means that they change their usual place of residence ever okay starting from here there is 37 around 36.9 percent is ever migrated population and if you go for the male and female 50 percent is female is ever migrated and male is 20.8 percent migrated so why the female is high percent so the female is high percent and this is the graph of the same thing here the female high it is because that are girls get married and the tradition is to move to the boys house that's what the female pro proportion is very high very high now the row here is the row here this one is a quantile and the quantile is a five equal partition of the ascending order consumption data you have the consumption data how much you do the consumption it means the expenditure for the food and the non-food and that can show that the rank of people that uh, you have the rich or poor that's what the one piece two piece three piece four piece five piece 20 20 percent population right so this quantile here so this graph shows that uh, as of it increased from poor to rich you see the proportion of the of the po population is also increased here for the ever migrated now reason of the inter, um, uh, ever reason for the migration now this table shows that uh, either they migrate for the family reason because they get married and move to the place new place or they follow the family because my parents moved and i have to move or some other family reason so broadly either they move because of the family reason or the non-family reason now the family reason is very high because of the marriage here because they get married and move to the another place so this is a very high following the family means that my parents moved and i have to move then this is very high but this portion is very small here non-family reason is very small and i'm focusing here 
and they move because they want an easier lifestyle that's what they moved they move because they are looking for a work they move because they want to get an education and a training and they move because they want to start a new job and these are a very small percentage here just like the easier lifestyle seven percent moved looking for work 3.45 percent moved and the education and training four percent moved right so these are the small proportion here but if you see the consumption quantile this is the consumption quantile from poor to rich right now for the marriage from the poor to rich here this is the decreasing curve for the marriage here you see it is a decreasing and if you see for the non family reason here it is an increasing trend here for you see and this is a very small percentage of people are here now in the ever migrated i am subsetting this non family reason internal non family reason only i am taking the only the subset of the ever migrated i am talking about now only this part now non family and they are internal migration only within the country now origin and origin and the destination of the non family reason internal migration so the whole, nepal is divided into the three ecological blend three ecological mountain hill and terrain mountain is a high mountain in the north uh, north that has a border with the tibet and the, in the middle is a hill and the terrain it is a south and it's a plain area now people are moving to the you see this is the all population and this is non family internal migration you see people are moving here you see this is the bot belt mountain hill tarai and there is the current belt mountain hill tarai this is the bot where they born and where they recently they are you see this one here most of the people moved either to the hill or to the tarai right people do not move to the mountain and for the all population also either they move to the hill or the tarai and if you see the origin for the urban and rural rural person rural population is very high so 91.2 percent comes from the rural and 8.8 percent come from the urban area now let's talk about the consumption quantile here now non-family reason internal migration is 7.4 percent in whole country and in urban they have the 16 and the rural has a 4 now if you look that data according to the poor to the rich scale poor to the rich scale now you see it is an increasing trend here here so as it increased from index of the poor to the rich it means that the non family internal migration also increase here that's what it is showing here that's what it is showing and the one thing is that uh, the whole country has only the 4.7 percent non-family region internal migration the whole country very small population and we are talking about does it make change in the socio-economic characteristics of the place now it is the same the table or man ruler but in the person it is according to the uh, column here 100 is here right so if you see here this one here this is non-family internal migration you see this person is here it is 74.3 percent it means that most of the non-family region are i very rich here because it's a rich quintile here they are rich people are here non-family region this if you see they are very rich people here and if you go to the urban 73 percent of them are in the richest quintile fifth quintile right that's what it is saying here and let's see the socio-economic characters here now this is a socio-economic characters here you see this one here this is a non-family internal migration and this is for all order now in the country there are 25.2 percent is a poverty level and for the non-family internal migration this is only 7.4 percent so their economic status is better right their poverty rate is very much small for order it is 25.2 and there is 7.4 farmland it means that agriculture household they do the farming agriculture right so their portion is very less compared to the order and one dwelling means that uh, they do not rent they live in their own house so this portion is of very small so it shows that uh, socio-economic characteristics is good for the non-family internal migration
and if you see the order population these are higher for order population just like electricity facility of electricity pipe water mobile literacy rate you see the literacy rate here it is higher for the non family internal migration and low for the order so this slide shows that the non family internal migrations are socio economically better than the order rates of the population now let's talk about the per capita consumption now if you see the per capita consumption consumption is calculated with either food consumption plus non food consumption that total makes the consumption right now from poor to the rich quantiles so there is not a difference but you if you see at the rich one it makes a little difference here you see this one here little bit difference in the richest quintile now let's talk about fitting a logistic model here so this is the binary data binary data means that either yes or no or either you are a non family internal migration or you are not right so binary data we fit a logistic regressions now this is for there is a two model one model is for the non family internal migration and another model is for the internal migration just for the comparison how it goes so non family internal migration here it is affected by the consumption it means that order odds is higher than one now you see this one odds here belt if you go to the hill and try you will find a lot of non family internal migration because odds is higher than one if you go to the age group you will find the age group more than 20 years uh, group from 21 and above it is higher than one so you will find those people non family internal migration and you see this one here you see this one here this is for the internal migration greater it is very much higher here right? compared to this one here and it is because of the family reason marriage because people get married that's what it is higher very much higher and if the education level increase it is possibly that the odds is higher that's what this one is higher here that's what this slide show now in one here just like the one dwelling has a negative coefficient here because it has a neg coefficient is negative it means our odds is greater less than one here right this has a negative coefficient farm household also has a negative coefficient and uh, this one here it is also negative ethnicity is also the is ethnicity tells a lot about our sociology right so so ethnicity has all all the negative coefficient it means our odds ratio is less than one so this says that uh, brahmin and chhatris are the ethnic ethnic group in my uh, ne uh, nepal uh, these are uh, mostly uh, just like the uh, uh, higher caste and uh, they, uh, a lot of government and non government are the, they they are uh, found they are found in the uh, government and non government and this is around 28% you see compared to the uh, brahmin and chhatris all order i have the negative here it means that they cannot migrate compared to these ones that's what it says okay so this is the logistic uh, com comparison uh, output for the non family internal migration and the internal migration here okay now discussion here is that uh, non family internal migration is small it is a 7.04 but it covers the very large proportion of the touch top richest consumption quintile even they are small population 7.4 it covers the richest quint quintile destination for the nfm population is urban or semi urban increasing trend in the proportion of nnf population as consumption quintile increases socio economic indicator are better for nfm population odds for nfm is higher for age greater than or 20 education higher then class 10 non poor people cell phone or else those facilities make the odds higher for the nfim and odds for the nfim lower is that lower is that if it is a agricultural household then its odds is very low that it will be the nfim living in the one dwelling one dwelling people living they can they are not on they makes the odds less and non brahmin also make the less or less similar that the pattern of nf population is possible in or now this is the one uh, example from uh, from this analysis data right similar pattern may be also available in the other countries now the M nf i mean could be the one of the factor that brings a socio economic change now the, if the socio economic being 
change make in the some locality that the non family internal migration could be one of the factor that can make a change okay thank you any question So this is only about the internal migration and uh, maybe the external migration has a different kind of uh, properties yeah this is only about the uh, uh, internal migration and non family internal migration so uh, external migration may have the different properties and it may depend upon the geography also geography also so i do not claim that uh, it uh, this is the general for everyone i'm just claiming that it is in nepal but it may 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 same properties may not be applied in everywhere right so it has to be analyzed according where which kind of a data it is well i'm really super happy to introduce talitha washington who's going to especially for you people you colleagues i should say creating data science programs this is the talk you have been waiting for the role of mathematics in undergraduate data science programs Thank you, Della. It, it really, Della, Della's just fantastic. She was asking where this image came from. Uh, I was featured in the Yukon Magazine. And do y'all remember the movie, Revenge of the Nerds? They called the article Revenge of the Data Scientists. Okay, kind of, yeah, and so that's where this image is from. You know, gotta got love them. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the role of mathematics in undergraduate data science programs. I'm also gonna talk about data science programs broadly, in particular as we're thinking about uh, building or rethinking uh, data science academic undergraduate programs. And so just a little bit about our work first, to say, kind of show you why would I be interested in this in the first place? Because it's my job. So I'm director of the Atlanta University Center Data Science Initiative, and Dr. Valley Montgomery Rice was a former chair of the Atlanta University Center Council of Presidents four presidents, Morehouse School of Medicine, Morehouse College, Spelman College, and Clark Atlanta University. And she says the Data Science Initiative has the potential to make the Atlanta University Center Consortium a national resource for experts in data analytics. This program will not only produce talented data scientists who be leaders in the field, but it will also increase the number of degree offerings in data science companies at HBCUs. Translated, I am to just help to build academic data science programs across 107 institutions. Right, okay. So that, that's the translation. Uh, so that's our mission, that's our goal. And it really is a mission of our four presidents who are really committed uh, to data science, not um, data science for one or two disciplines, but really data science across all disciplines. So I think of, I am a mathematician, dynamical systems. I got into this thing of data science by my students. Uh, independent study with one turned to another independent study with three, which turned into a topics course, which turned into you know, running the, you know, the data science I use, that's what, improving undergraduate STEM education portfolio at the NSF, uh, to running in the Convergence Accelerator, which is now in TIP at NSF. You know, data-driven models and algorithms into running a, now I'm director of data science, oh, data science initiative. Um, so really one thing led to another. Uh, so, and, and it's a fun journey. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show a video, I'm trying to follow Dr. Abiyomi here, um, about our work so you can kind of get a, a taste, a, at least a small taste, and then I'll um, shift and talk about academic program side of things. Um, so everybody, we're in Atlanta, so that's the skyline. N now I see to me, you can't find the mouse.
Data science. Data science. Data science. For the W.E.B. Du Bois Data Science Symposium hosted by the Atlanta University Center. Data science. Checking in at the Black Party. Want to say shout out to United Health Group. Inspiration that drives performance in your life, bitch. Best word. Let's get it. Hello, I'm Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens. Welcome to the W.B. Du Bois Data Science Symposium. In terms of donating, offering resources to institutions, our institutions in particular, so that we're able to continue to grow and then also develop. So as you can see, our, our work spans a, a multiple um, facets uh, of the academy along with our industry and government partners uh, and it's a lot of fun so it's super fun okay so I'm gonna just back it up a little bit and so just to kind of I'm a mathematician so I like to define things first principles how are we thinking about data science we can think about data science with the goal in mind to extract useful information from a data set uh, that data set could be images, it could be numbers, it could be text, it could be blah, right? You know, how are, you have to define what that blah is. And then how are we going to extract useful information from it? Now, we can also ask the question, well, what does this um, data scientist do as our schools are asking us to kickstart programs in data science? Well, students say, well, what am I going to, what do they actually do? And so this is from IBM, Data Science Introduction. And I highlighted the words mathematics and statistics for obvious reasons, right? Um, apply mathematics, statistics, and the scientific method. And they also use a wide range of tools and techniques, anything from SQL to data mining to data integration methods. And really, there's a goal of extracting insights, maybe using some predictive analytics so we can make money in the, the music industry and AI, uh, ML, deep learning, all the learnings. And then also write applications where we can automate some of these data processes. A lot of data you hear is telling the story. We may see some numbers. What does that mean? How does that help us understand what's going on? And then also, how can they help us solve these business problems? And so there's, there's a lot of math and statistics that's happening in data science. And, there's, and so going back to the first bullet, and it's also the scientific method. So I see data science as using, you know, working with, playing with, sometimes it's more like fun, with data, but then also employing the scientific method to data, which in my mind brings the data science together. So what do we mean by data, the scientific method? Well, this is from, uh, I used to live in, in Maryland, uh, Montgomery County, and so this is what they had on their website, that first you choose a problem to investigate, whether if you're looking at, you know, what's the data set or what's the whatever that you're looking at. And then you want to figure out what's going on, doing the background research, understand the problem, um, maybe have a hypothesis, maybe we can do this with this, maybe it can tell that, or, or maybe cannot tell this. Um, and then carry out experiments, some sort of data analysis. A lot of people like to start with visualizations or just looking at the data, understanding what it is, applying different techniques depending on what you have and what you would like to do to carry out the uh, analysis aspect. And then you also want to look back at the data. Did my mo models predict it correct? It, do I need to go back and are the, is the curve that I want, is it higher than, than, than what I expect it to do? And so sometimes you'll have that feedback loop, perhaps a predictor corrector sort of thing. And then you want to discuss your results. And it's in that discussion where we can find, do, do we really capture what's happening? Can we really predict? Or, or maybe we need to go back. And so I see this data science as employing the scientific method with data. 
Also, people talk about this thing called the data science life cycle. So when we carry out this data science project, what I feel is lurking in the background really is that scientific method, but now we're just working with data. Where first, again, you understand, define the problem, then you collect the data. Um, maybe you have it already, or maybe you need to generate some fake data, I guess like fake news, generate some fake data, right, to, to fill in place because you may have an incomplete data set. And then you want to clean, prepare, do some exploratory analysis to figure out kind of what direction do you want to go for either model building and deployment. And then you may need to go back and redefine the problem. So this is a, a nice simplified view of a data science life cycle. So when we think about developing projects for students, it's like students kind of go through this cycle as they carry out a data science project. Now there are other data science life cycles where you can add more stuff to it depending on what sort of competencies you would want your students to experience. This is another uh, data science life cycle where you start in the upper left. Remember before it said to collect data, in this case it just says capture. And you could capture data entry, signal reception, data extraction. And then you want to maintain data cleaning, staging, processing, architecture, and then processing maybe some more advanced techniques like mining, clustering, modeling, summarization, and then doing some analysis. Uh, Dr. Manahar talked about regression, text minus, qualitative, predictive, and then communicating, business intelligence, decision making, visualizations, and then going back, maybe need more data, and then you go a loop again. So these are just kind of two different, so when we think about this data science life cycle, so again, I'm thinking data science undergraduate education. Where are your students? And then what sort of depth of this life cycle do you want them to carry through? So I kind of wanted just to show two different extremes, one which is kind of here it is, like at a first pass, and you can make it more complicated and add on to it as well. Now, of course, I do not have all the answers. Uh, Y'all already know how I feel about linear algebra. I, don't, I love linear algebra. I'm just teasing. That's just bad jokes. Actually, I love it. I took linear algebra in Mexico. Uh, a fantastic time. Oh, it's, but this is a report that just came out from the National Academies. Even though it's K-12, the same questions are happening in higher education. Like, what competencies make up data fluencies? Like, what do we want our students to learn with this data stuff? How can these competencies be measured? How do we evaluate them? How do we assess them, right? We have to have an evaluation assessment, not only in the class, but in a course and also in curriculum. And then what kind of experiences might help bring these data fluency competencies? Is it projects? Is it teamwork? Is it quizzes? Is it exams? Is it this? Is it that, right? Uh, what tools and data sets are needed to support our learners in acquiring data understanding and skills? And then, you, you know, is it, is it R? Is it Python? Is it this? <laughs> uh, again, I don't have all the answers. And then how can data science be meaningfully integrated in both STEM and non-STEM courses? So again, they're asking these questions at the K-12 level. We, eat, we are asking the same questions at the undergraduate level as well, as far as education goes. Um, and so how do we do data science? How do we integrate it across uh, the wide curriculum, both STEM and non-STEM? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a great article to read. Also, way back, way back in the day in 2016, I drove from all the way from Washington, D.C., to Salt Lake City, Utah with my kid. Do not stay in a sheep wagon in Wyoming. That was a bad idea, but anyway, we, we fixed that. Okay, Airbnb, you know, another story. But anyway, I participated in the Mark's, uh, Park City Math Institute, which is a three-week program, Salt Lake City. It's a program of the Institute for Advanced Study, summer program. They have different tiers for faculty research with grad students, K-12, undergrads, super fun three weeks of math, all you can eat food, and two hot tubs, like the hot mineral springs. It was fantastic. I had a great time. Um, so we, I was in the faculty group, and we talked about, well, what do our students need to know with respect to data science? Uh, and so first we had to figure out, well, what is data? That was a whole day to define data. It's an undefined term, right? Just let it go. Um, and so Back in 2014, there was a STAT and a CEF uh, meeting where they said science of planning for acquisition, management analysis, and, and inference from data. And then we also, we wrote a paper that talked about these curriculum guidelines. Now, many of these people that wrote the paper are very mathy, 
And so, I don't know if that's a word, but yeah, it's more on the math side. So whoever is talking about data science will talk about it from their discipline, and that will be their, um, how do you call it, rose-colored glasses. You know, because it's, it's, I think, uh, but now you said it right, like different disciplines will kind of see and interact with data science differently. Uh, and so here, what I really liked about this, this article was that we really want to use data to describe the world. There are theoretical foundations, stats, computer science, mathematics, and it's also important to interpret the data in which it lives. So that's a, that article is freely available online. Um, and in here, there were key competencies that we identified. Computational statistical thinking, math foundations, model building assessment, algorithm software foundation, data curation, knowledge transference. Now, remember, I answered the four presidents who want me to develop this curriculum thing of data science across four institutions, right? And uh, so what I did was I put together a working group made up of folks from all the institutions, and we kind of just hammered out, well, what do we want our students to know? In this working group, we had mathematicians, computer scientists, um, social scientists, health sciences, librarian, um, chemist, I'm kind of going through them in my mind, business, uh, I said political science, uh, biology. So we had all these different disciplines represented in this working group from four different institutions and the library, and we're supposed to agree. One of the things, I think the most contentious point in our discussion was around that algorithms and software foundation. And uh, one, one person said, we should do algorithmic thinking. I said, no, nah, we can't produce students in data science who can't program. Like if they can't do an R or, or do an R, I don't know if that's like, sounds like a dance. If they can't do an R or do a Python, uh, <laughs> What are we doing here? So that, that was the most contentious. But at the end of the day, we said, okay, you know, let, let's, we took the literature, both that one, and there was also a study from the National Academy of Sciences as well, and it just kind of came up w with our own based on uh, what was in the literature and identified the six learning outcomes, math statistics, computer programming, modeling, data curation, ethics, and communication. Some places put ethics and communication together, but we thought important that ethics on its own is important, communication on its own is important. Um, why is that? Well, when we start to develop curriculum and you have to evaluate how is that course hitting that aspect of it, or in your course, how are you touching on data creation, ethics, communication, it's a little bit easier if it's decoupled, at least in my mind, the topics are. And so this, these learning outcomes for us really formulate how we think about data science education, including training, which includes our workshops as well. So now in our workshop post-evaluation, we have a question that identifies, did the workshop kind of, how did it hit these six learning outcomes? And we'll be looking at assessing that. Our minor uh, is, the first course is data in the African diaspora course. That's a zero prerequisite course that teaches data science thinking based off of data sets of those of the African diaspora. Um, so that course is still, it, it's, it's official, like it's on the books, we'll say, at Morehouse College, and Professor Yvonne Phillips in computer science really has led the way there. And this fall, uh, Professor Ivis King, who's professor of social work, is gonna teach it at Clark Atlanta. So we'll come back together in December and compare notes to see, because in this course you have the data science skills and competencies. You also have the social science aspect of the context of the data. It's the African diaspora piece, and really having students go through this course, it's modular in format, where this module has a data set, data science skills identified that you want students to learn, social science piece that you want students to learn, and then project base for each of these modules. So if you're a professor coming from computer science, well, how, are you, how does a social scientist do that aspect in the module? And then vice versa, if you're a social scientist, well, how does the, you know, let's say, I'm, I'm bootstrapping, y'all get what I'm saying, the computer science professor handle, talk about the technical. So there's a bit of, uh, I think, a challenge for the instructor to be fluent, or we'll say multilingual uh, in, in this case, which, which is, I think it's exciting. So I'm really excited about how it's being developed and it's really developed in a community of scholars. 
And Professor Yvonne Phillips has led workshops this summer on teaching data in the African diaspora, where it really is interactive of, she's like, this is what I've done, and then people will talk back and forth. And so I'm really excited about that. We, they also have to do a math stats course, computer programming course, uh, data science one course. Dr. Manninhar has been um, actively involved in developing. We'll be teaching that at Clark Atlanta, and then also an elective. About six courses in the minor. Um, and so, we, so that, that's just an example of a minor. Of course, I like it because that's ours, right? Yeah. Okay, so some examples of major. Um, so my kid who left me today is at Xavier, and she's a double major in math and data science. I was like, you should come. She's like, Mom, I have to go to Berkeley tomorrow and do this Python programming pro, yeah, that's fine, whatever, you know, okay. You can't, I can't be mad at that, so anyway. So I said, what is my kid doing at Xavier? Well, they just launched a data science major, I want to say like last year. And so their data science major, I believe, is emanated from the math department. In the math department, they have statistics as a major. And so I think they are building, so I'm guessing, they're building on their statistical foundations that they already had in the math department, bootstrapping that up to a data science major. Uh, Xavier is really well known for uh, preparing students to go on to medical school. So statistics is very important. Biostatistics, uh, applied statistics, I think is also one of their uh, four majors in the math department there. Um, so they're thinking about it, again, so I, th this vantage point is from more of a math statistics point of view. The way that they bucketed the courses is there are a slate of data science courses and they have their own acronym, DSTC, uh, for it. One of the things we've grappled with is where should data science courses live? Now, you may have courses on your campus that you can kind of pull from, and you may have to create them. Well, where should they go? Should they go in a department, or should you make a new you know, acronym program code? Because you know, there's that whole funding model, students and who gets money, what department. I'll stay out of that. That's too much for me. Anyway, so but they have these courses at, for data science. Uh, data mining, intro to machine learning, predictive analytics, and then they have, also have capstone course. They also have a slate of computer science courses, uh, data structures, databases, uh, data mining, a very common in, in every, uh, most um, data science majors. And then math, it's intro to calc, elementary linear algebra, calc one, two and three. Um, and then statistics, Again, I think this came out of statistics, right? So the stat methods one and two, biostatistics. At Xavier, they'll have courses, core courses for those who are going to medical school, and they'll have, it's, it's almost like supplemental instruction, but it's a part of a course. They call it drill, where it's like a laboratory thing, kind of, where you kind of, let's drill it and, and get this stuff so you really know it, sort of. It's hands-on, it's interactive, it's, it's that. I hope I'm explaining that right. Uh, and then also regression analysis, analysis of variance, problem stats. And then there's some free electives. And so they bucket the data science major in those aspects. Again, I think their major is coming from the math stat perspective. Another example is at FISC. The FISC major is coming from a computer science perspective, I think. This is my, my read of it. And also my friend runs the program. Um, yeah, Sajid Hussain, he's fantastic. He, um, Fisk is the first um, historically black college and university to have a data science major and a first institution in the state of Tennessee with a data science major. So, yeah, so geez, you know, I, I, I love my friends. Uh, and so they're looking at bringing innovation to passion. Here's data science and there's another discipline there with it. Um, so there's computational thinking. So those, they start with the computer science courses. Again, we're going through the lens of computer science. CS1 and 2, like data structures is, is like bread and butter for all of this. And then advanced computer science. So these are computer science courses, and I think this is where us math folks sometimes uh, could be more proactive, right? Like the math person in me, like math modeling, that should be at math, right? So I'll just, I'll just put that out there. But, but that sometimes may challenge us to look at our curriculum and say how we are doing it and how we can do it in a way that maybe involves real data set, involves programming, involves project-based learning, right? So it may take conversations sitting down with other disciplines and say, well, how do you do this? So we can, 
you know, naturally, I think naturally do this in the math department. But all of those are computer science courses, database management, machine learning can be done in math too, or at least cross-listed, but anyway. Um, and then they have seminars at each of the levels. That's just the structure of their school. It's like one credit hour seminars. For math and stat, it's calc uh, one and two, so not three, not calculus three. And this is for the BS. The BA, I think, is just calc one, right? So they have a BA and BS in, in data science. This is the BS degree. Uh, linear algebra, I just had to say that. I didn't see linear in the previous one, so yeah. Okay, so there's, there's not a consensus on what you need. Um, and then they want to, it's a, it could be a stats course, biostats, or a stats for social science research. And, and again, you know, when you have that myriad, you want to look at, well, how can, how, what are the commonalities in all these courses, either in the, the learning, you know, how does it hit your uh, key points you want to evaluate. And then you can do three to four courses in an area. So everybody who's a data science major there has an area of focus, either a biology area or business or music or physics, right? So it's a data science major and then there's like an area. The way that we're thinking about the minor at the LA University Center is that there's a minor that complements the major. You see that? Yeah, so it's kind of, in my mind, this is kind of like a flip model of how we're thinking about the major minor. Here's one more example uh, from an engineering perspective, right? So just kind of giving you different flavors about how I think different disciplines are thinking about it. Uh, we were just at Minnesota the other week, by the way, and hung out with them. It was a lot of fun. Uh, they have a recently launched data science initiative as well. And so theirs is, they just kind of, you know, looking across the school. And this is how most people start a data science programs. Because y'all said y'all going to start them, right? So you just look around school. Who does anything data, right? Just ask that question. Do you do anything data? That could be the data itself. That could be statistics. That could be pro computer programming. You know, anything data grab those people, the people they found uh, lived in comp sci and engineering. That's who they start with. So again, this is from an engineering perspective, stats, math, industri you know, ISC, industrial and systems engineering. So they brought these different folks together to create this major, right? And so the math here is Calc 1 through 3 and elementary computational linear algebra. Um, so engineers, uh, at least for my, I'm an applied mathematician, so I work well with engineers, love them to death. They like the applied aspect. So not just the linear algebra proof base, it, it's that and, there's, you know, doing some programming, right? Maybe use some MATLAB in there, you know, so you can handle matrices. Some, something more of an of applied nature. Elementary computational may be easier, let's, softer, or not, that's not good words, not as much on the theory, yeah. I know. This is, I was like, what are they doing? Some places, um, they're recorded, so I'm trying to behave, right? So, when you ha and so we fell into this trap as well, right? And y'all will fall, y'all get there. And when you do, just, you know, send me an email, say, yeah, we went through that. You'll get all these different disciplines in a room saying, no, this must be in data science. No, this must be there. Everything you know, everybody's going to have a must-have in data science. And then you can be like, really? Do you really need, to, really, right? And so when you throw everything in there, it becomes, un, I think, unwieldy. And so that's when you, you want to have that heart-to-heart -heart talk. What is really needed? What do we want to prepare students for? Yeah, when I saw this, the list kept going on. Okay. Just. I thought it was interesting. They have a technical writing course that was separate from data science. If it was me, I would rather have write, I'd like to write. I would like to have that writing throughout. And I tell you, okay, so I'm gonna digress slightly. Before I went to NSF, wait, so when did I go there, 2017? So this is 2015. I actually had, you grab my colleagues from across, I was at Howard University at the time, grab my colleagues. It was like, you know, anybody who did computational physics, computational chemistry, all, you know, all my friends, you know, education, you know. Let's do this thing of, you know, we had a writing across the curriculum. Remember that was the big thing, writing? So I was like, well, let's, instead, let's have WAC and, I don't know, it's a better acronym, DAC, data across the curriculum. So my idea was how do we talk about data across the curriculum and what does that mean? Basically paralleling what we 
thought about, at least from a curricular standpoint of the writing across the curriculum. I think I was a little green at the time, still green, and you're wearing green, I like green. Um, I was green at the time, you know, about how do I do that? And I, I remember proposing this to our dean at the time, and he said, that's too hard. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's what we, I, I think I was too soon. I don't know. Yeah. Huh? Oh, I thought somebody said something. Okay. But anyway, so that, that kind of gives a perspective. So you, you, when you develop these programs, you want to think about when you have all the different disciplines, everybody throw everything at the wall. Just let the floodgates open. There's no such thing as no or that's a crazy idea. Just do it. And then say, okay, now let's whittle it down. Um, maybe through a brute force uh, cluster analysis of qualitative topics. <laughs> that usually works. You know, you just got to, Yeah. Um, and then there's this thing of SIP codes. These are the classification of instructional programs. Now, when did these come in? Was it 2020, 2019, that the data science SIP code happened? Does anybody know? Okay, so it was around there. There were data science academic programs before, okay, let me back it up. Department of Education, yeah? So when schools like report their majors or when they report the data, each of your programs are related to some sort of SIP code. Not your street, but you know, like a SIP code. That's what they call them. And so the data science um, general SIP code came a little bit later. And some schools, even though they'll have data science programs, they'll use like a computer science SIP code or something else because this did not exist. Uh, and so this is how we can, uh, let's say, catalog uh, curricular academic programs. Um, at the institution. It's the same zip code uh, regardless if it's undergrad or graduate. Okay. And so this is um, what they uh, classify or describe as the data science general. There are more and it's broken down. They're pretty fun to explore. Uh, but again, it's that analysis of large scale data sources, interdisciplinary, and then on here, of course, we have mathematical modeling, quantitative analysis, statistics, visual analytics. All of these, I think, play nicely into how mathematics departments can really say, yeah, we, got, we can do that, we can do that, we can do that with and, right? And sometimes it may be talking with computer science faculty to say, okay, how do you do this thing of programming, right, in, in what we're doing? Or how, how do you see this uh, in statistics? How can we make it more less of a cookie cutter statistics course to a here's a live data set and, and start teaching students how to explore and, while using the statistical methods. One of the things that we do in the summertime is it's a one week program for incoming students uh, to basically get their feet in the water for a data science project. We have, it's almost like a, a pre-REU kind of like where we have instructors, Dr. Manahar was an instructor. So we'll have instructors and a research mentor who's an upper level undergraduate or graduate student, and they'll have participants of incoming students, roughly six to seven incoming students. They'll work on a research project, and then by the end of the week, they, they give a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and this has been a great tool, obviously for students to learn data science before they come in you know, the whole identify, you know, the, the STEM identity, they identify, oh, data science is something cool. We've had students go off and do other programs in the, right, the next year. Projects use Python, they use R, and uh, we have like all hands meetings. It's super fun. We're almost, hopefully that paper will be accepted. We're actually writing a paper on it. And people ask us, in a week, can you do it? The answer is yes. Uh, and this year, the topic was using data to advocate for health justice. This also provides our faculty an opportunity to try out a new data set, right? Sometimes if you try it out in a class, a, a, a lot of students will say, you don't, want to, you don't want that train wreck in your class, right? We've all been there in that semester. You're like, oh, why did I do that project, right? So this gives a nice way where we, we can explore with students, try out a data set, and see how it goes and, and have that back and forth with the students. Just to give you a taste of it, um, that's Professor Alicia Daniel, Professor of Criminal Justice, where she provided uh, the students with the data set um, looking at the question, how does mental health influence mass shootings? And they, when they explored the data set, they found that the top was um, history of mental illness, 
um, tendencies of suicide, and there was already a sign of crisis. So for the students to look at, you know, there was on the left pie chart, the gray area, is, there's a sign of crisis. 81% of folks had a sign of crisis before there was a mass shooting. And so the students are going, there was a sign and nobody did anything. So seeing the mental health as a prevention of keep, keeping people safe um, in mass shootings and doing this through data. Um, and so this is what her students, a part of, I'll say, what her students present, produce by the end of the week. Uh, and y'all know by now I like videos. Can I show one more video? Okay, time. Can I show one more? This video is pretty cool. This is from another group, Dr. King's group. So they talk about how they used R in their project. So she's a professor of social work, so they looked at data that spoke to child welfare. So this is a one-week program, and I said, how did they do that? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's a virtual program. And so they were able to generate data sets in R and kind of create a movie that summarized how they interacted with R, how they interacted with the data set. So it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun work. Um, and so with us, we have industry partners that work alongside with us. One of the things that I'm working on is we have curriculum we're developing in academia. There's curriculum developing in industry. How do we talk, right? There's this thing called IP, you know, everybody wants to own their intellect. Mine's not that important, so nobody cares about mine, but um, people care about theirs. So how do we bridge that? So we're talking with each other. So we're not training students in data science, and then there's some sort of discontinuity when they go into industry and they're expected to know something else, right? Because if we're not talking, how do we bridge that continuity, right? That's one of the open questions in my mind. We're also, um, I'm also PI of NSF um, Includes, which is a National Data Science Alliance, which hosts uh, for HBC faculty and staff uh, workshops. We'll be launching curriculum development work groups this, this uh, coming up academic year and research affinity cohorts next summer. And this is a collaboration with Fisk University, um, Clark Atlanta University, and also Howard University. Um, so that's a, another big project that I have, which is, yeah, I don't sleep that much. Uh, but that is super fun just to kind of figure out and see what other people are doing and how. Infomercial, if you'd ever like to visit Atlanta, as president of the Association for Women in Mathematics, I invite you to our research symposium. Yeah, I'm the president too. Madam President, um, that will be held at Clark Atlanta University on September 30th through October 2nd. Uh, the Monday lecture is going to be with Dr. Monica Jackson, who's at American, who does geospatial modeling. Also happens to be a Clark Atlanta alum. So, yeah, y'all come down. Um, so, that concludes my presentation. I don't know if I have any time for questions. Della will let me know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, and more yes. So, like, even in our pre-freshman summer experience program, we're almost wondering if we should require, so some use Excel, and we're almost wondering if we should require our Python Tableau. So the answer is yes. Um, and so when you're thinking about ways, because I know people uh, in here have an appetite for learning and workshops, we held a Tableau workshop, and the person who did it is from our institutional research office. Because you're, more often than not, there's going to be some data person, right, in your institutional research office, because they're collecting data on the institution, they have to do reports and all that data graphic stuff, and they create, uh, Felicia White of Spelman College. She was the one who created the Tableau dashboards for the college that are publicly displayed. And we're like, hey, can you come do a workshop on that? Like, how? and she did, and she was great. She, it was her first one ever because, you know, she's the data science researcher in the back room, right? But she was fantastic, you know, it, she was great. So when you look at, so Tableau, yes. And because I think you said workshops too, right? You wanted to learn more about? 
Yeah. So if you, and if you look at, um, where, where are you located? Yeah. So the state of New York, or maybe in your region, I don't know if it's in your region, or at least the state of New York, you can also look for government folks who create data dashboards, either for police departments or in your um, state government, sometimes local government. Usually it's at the state level. State level has um, dashboards and, and police departments, many of them also have dashboards. So if you're looking for people who could come in and just talk about dashboards, how to use either Tableau or maybe some of the other platforms, they, they would be a great resource. And if they're public servants, maybe they'll do it for free. I just, just, yeah, just toss that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And somebody said community college and certificate programs, right? Okay, so um, I looked this up. I just want to make sure I, I said it. So in, I lived in Maryland. So have you heard of Montgomery College? So just Google, Google search up. I don't know if that's what they're supposed to say. But Montgomery College, it's a community college in Maryland. They have a data science certificate program and it's listed on the webpage. Uh, and I looked it up now, I don't remember what it was. Uh, but they have like an elementary stats. There's an intro to data science. I think it's like five courses for their certificate program. They also have, I think, an associate's degree in data science. And they're very, I think, ahead of, of many places. Like they, they've had this for a while. Let's see, when did I move? In 2020? So it was pre-2020. So they've had this program for, for a good while. They didn't just kick it up yesterday. Uh, but look, I would say look there uh, for their program. They're public institutions so they can share maybe some of the stuff behind uh, the website on the curriculum uh, with you. Yeah. Yeah. No, we actually just did a workshop. It was called, I titled it, so I like the title. It was the only title that was, I came up with that was actually good. The rest of them were terrible. It was called Demystifying Deep Learning. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, it's great. Antonio, you know, some random Zoom call. I was like, can you do a workshop, Antonio? Yeah, great. Um, and he did, he, he nailed it. Uh, so you have a, there, people usually will do like at a major level, machine learning. I think you can touch in deep learning. I think there are, how do you say it, there's so many topics of data science that you can choose from. What works? All right. Once you get, you know, there's that foundational piece that, you know, has to be fought over. I mean, decided upon, right? People fight it out usually in academia. Uh, but once you decide that foundational piece, there are a lot of different directions. We cannot teach our students every aspect about data science. That's, I think, impossible, right? Like we can't teach our students everything about mathematics. So we have to, at, at least at the undergraduate level, kind of pick and choose and then hope that builds uh, a hunger for, for more, a curiosity to learn more later, right? Um, so it doesn't mean you have to do it, you can. I haven't really seen it as like a requirement for an undergraduate major as far as, you know what I mean, like the baseline, but that doesn't mean it can't be like an elective or included in like a data science one or a data science two or something like that. Is that helpful? Because you could you put everything in there, now you're going to be in Minnesota. I'm just, <laughs> no, we ran into that trap. And I was like, this is the minor, right? When we're doing the minor, everybody wants to, so this is, sorry, linear algebra. I said, we're not doing linear algebra in a minor? What are you doing? Right, yeah. A, a more, let's say, I don't want to say loose, but more free, free, where the student can be more independent in selecting. If you look up Davidson College, their data science minor is very much, these couple courses are required, just take the, you know, pick from the rest. Right, so you'll have Davidson where it's, it's more free form. You have some that want it completely structured, at least for major or minor. But deep learning, I haven't seen it as a requirement. Linear algebra, it depends at the major. Usually more common at the BS uh, major. 